a trip to the moon is no longer a dream. It's as near as tomorrow. It's as real as a rocket racing through space. Years ago, before space travel was either near or real, writers were sending their heroes into orbit with their pens. One of them was H.G. Wells, who wrote a book called The First Men in the Moon. I was living in England, writes the hero of Wells' book, next door to an odd little scientist named Cavour. On October 14th, 1899, I was standing on my veranda when suddenly... Cavour's house was going up. The trees about the buildings tore themselves to pieces and sprang skyward. And then came a screaming wind. Finally, a shining bluish substance rushed upward, and the worst of it was all over. Later, Cavour explained that the explosion was caused by a substance he had invented, which cut off the force of gravity. He called it Cavorite. Imagine a hollow sphere enameled with Cavorite, he said. In such a vehicle, we could travel indefinitely into space, to the moon, perhaps. This is tremendous, I cried. Let's go to work at once. For months, we worked with unflagging enthusiasm, to a glass sphere, we affixed steel blinds which could be coated with cavorite. When the blinds were closed, we'd fly through space. By simply raising one or more of them, we'd be attracted by any heavy body that chanced to be in our direction. When all was ready, we crawled into the sphere. We sat waiting for the cavorite to reach its final stage and release us from the gravitational pull of the earth. Suddenly, there came a little jerk. And in a moment, we were flying as swiftly as a bullet up and into the gulf of space. It was the strangest sensation. It was not like the beginning of a journey. It was like the beginning of a dream. One day, Cavour suddenly opened six of the blinds. The great mountains and craters of the moon leaped into view. He rushed about opening and shutting blinds, and then came a jar. And then we were rolling over and over and down a slope. We landed toward the end of a freezing lunar night, as long as 14 of ours, but as we waited, the lunar day broke. Come on, I cried. There are little round objects over there that look like seeds. There's life here. As we watched, first one... Then another cracked open and sent up a yellowish-green shoot. The plants grew so quickly they soon covered the ground. If plants could grow on the moon, it meant there was air, air that we could breathe. We raised the manhole cover of the sphere and dropped upon the untrodden soil of the moon. Because our weight was barely a sixth of what it was on Earth, we found a small jump, sent us flying through the air in a horrible and yet delightful nightmarish fashion. So we decided to practice leaping so we wouldn't smash ourselves on the rocks. After about 30 jumps, we found we could judge distance with assurance. We looked about us. See how fast the plants have been growing, said Cavour. It makes the terrain look different. Suddenly, a terrifying thought struck me. Cavour, I cried, where is the sphere? It was nowhere to be seen. Then we heard a dull pounding coming from beneath our feet. What can it be, I asked Cavour. Then there was another sound. It was like the bellowing of great beasts. Turning about, we saw the shining sides of a herd of gigantic moon calves. Cavour, look! Behind the moon calves, a strange-looking creature came into view. It was a moon man, a selenite. He was scarcely five feet high. He seemed rather like a complicated insect. We crawled through the lunar jungle, daring to do nothing until we found our sphere. But our need for food became overpowering. We ate a mushroom-like plant, and it made us drunk. In a daze, I became aware that some selenites were staring at us, and then, then all was darkness. We awoke in a sort of cavern inside the moon. Our hands and our feet were bound with gold chains. Selenites brought us food. Then they loosened our bonds and led us through the cavern. We saw a vast mass of machinery and active movement. This explained the dull pounding we heard. 
We walked until we reached what seemed to be the edge of a cliff. The Selenites wanted us to walk on a narrow plank that projected from it out into the void. As we stood there, stubbornly refusing to move, one of the guards pricked me with his weapon. I swung around in a fury. My anger released some reserve store of energy, and I snapped my chains. I struck the guard and sent him spinning. The other Selenites turned and scurried off into the darkness. I broke Gabor's chains, and we set off in great flying strides. We heard a tumult of sounds advancing upon us. We saw a light coming from above. We climbed toward it and found a cavern where moon butchers were busily cutting up the carcasses of moon calves. We were attacked from below and we ran into the cavern of the moon butchers. They let loose a volley of spears. Let's get behind the carcasses of the moon calves and work our way up the cave, I called to Cavour. When we got to the last carcass, we made a run for it, swinging right and left. We hurtled through the flimsy moon people, leaving them behind. We ran up the tunnel and emerged at last into the sunlight of the surface. Now, now we have to find the sphere, Cavour said. We must get away from here before the freezing lunar night falls. We set up a marker and searched separately around it. As the cold evening air was closing in, I found it! Now I had to find Cavour, but there was no sign of him. And then I saw a note, a note that read, They've been chasing me. It said, I intend, and then the note ended abruptly. Poor Kabul. The Selenites had gotten him. I had no choice. I returned to the sphere. I screwed the manhole cover into place, fumbled with the switches. Something clicked, and in an instant, I was in the silence and the darkness of interplanetary space. Several months after I returned to Earth, I received a letter from a Dutch scientist who was picking up messages in English from the moon. Cavour was still alive. I hurried to the scientist's observatory. He told me Cavour had described the complex life of the Selenites in the caverns of the moon. While I was there, another message came in. Cavour said he had met the Grand Lunar, the master of the moon. He told him about life on Earth, about our quarrels and our wars. What a fool Cavour was. He told the Grand Lunar all that was bad about man when it was plain that upon Cavour alone rested the responsibility of other men reaching the moon. And suddenly, like a cry in the night, there was another message from Cavour. I was mad to let the Grand Lunar know it read. And that was all. After that, only a silence that had no end.